I like that. Thank you. Ooh, it's like a movie preview. The new James Bond movie. <laughs> yes. Folks, good evening. Is uh, did everyone have a good day? Is is there energy in this room? We know there's going to be good noodles at halftime, and so you just have to hang in there till late thirty. Welcome, welcome. I'm recognizing faces. Professor Fu is here. We can start. So, folks, I, I thought we got off to. I had a very good time yesterday, and I. Uh, that makes me happy. I, I hope that we had the beginnings of a good discussion of ideas. And tonight we're going to do some new material and I related to green real estate. And I'm going to try to free up more time for discussion and do fewer slides. We're going to be focusing in the first hour on commercial real estate and in the second hour on residential real estate. And I hope some of this interests you. So. Here's another laundry list. So if you remember last night when I defined what's a green city, everyone went crazy. That was a sign that everyone was awake. So let me make everyone angry again, since that appears to be the only thing I'm good at. E, so when, when, e, when you say, Professor Khan, what do you think is a green commercial real estate? Let me name some criteria. And uh, th these are in, since I have a random mind, these are in random order. Uh, and we can ask ourselves, as intellectuals and as developers, how important is this stuff? So if I were evaluating a piece of commercial real estate, uh, some building in some central business district, my formula or recipe, yeah, we can make some bunnies, uh, uh, my, my formula for, for, for green real estate would have some combination of being energy efficient Given my interest in adaptation to climate change, I added this robust to temperature. In English, that means if it's 100 degrees outside, will this building's energy consumption go up 55%? Or can you just, by consuming just a couple of more kilowatts of power, make people comfortable? If the building had solar panels, if it's water efficient, have you noticed that in any bathrooms, it's sort of hard to flush the toilet? That was supposed to be a joke. Uh, so we're seeing real water efficiency, uh, and we can talk about the costs and benefits of that. Natural light. Uh, to, to be able to work in a space where you, you use natural light, uh, I think, is, is good for the mind. From a low-carbon perspective, proximity to public transit, so that it's not a car, suburban, mall location, close to green space, back to adaptation to climate change again, sturdy enough to withstand natural disasters. And many of my colleagues at UCLA are proponents, and I am as well, of life cycle analysis, that, that, that the project be green to produce, and at the end of the life of the project, that you can dispose of the material in an environmentally friendly way. And so I think that life cycle analysis, that a green building should be green to produce, green in use, and green when you retire the building, are all admirable characteristics. Folks, what I want us thinking about today is not how I'm going to trip over this chair, but for for-profit real estate developers, what are their incentives to build buildings and to retrofit buildings with these characteristics? That's going to be one of our agendas. Does anyone want to boo this? We're 54 minutes away from the noodles. The professor, I'm looking at the professors. They look like they can do it. Oh, oh so now I get modest. Uh, why are economists any use in thinking about this? You guys might say you're not any use at all. You're just mildly amusing. I'm not an engineer. I'm not qualified to, to say what are the best technologies for, judge, uh, for how to do this. What economists bring to the party is our relentless thinking about the costs and benefits of any action, uh, whether it's showing up for tonight's class, uh, or whether it is embodying in your building these characteristics. I also think that we're very good at this bottom bullet point, which uh, let me read to you since I don't understand it. We can anticipate the set of conditions that would raise the probability that a business person would go green. So we're very good at thinking about incentives. What incentives would be needed? What incentives could government introduce 
without so without just ordering developers that you have to do these things when would a for-profit developer voluntarily take these steps and folks that's what i want us thinking about now if you said professor what's the relative importance of these we can come back to that point but i think that all of these characteristics matter folks let me come to a complete stop it, given that i didn't want very small font does anyone want to add an extra bullet point that you give the professor a B plus and name another criteria you'd like a green building, you would expect from a green building? Indoor air environment. Indoor air environment. So put that in a sentence. That sounds like a correct answer. There, there should be air. Uh, we, I, I grant the people that. Uh, so the quality of the air. So that's excellent. So, so absolutely. So I am adding here the quality of indoor air that, that workers, I believe, need oxygen, and uh, th there's probably other things they need to be productive and healthy inside. Folks, another bullet point you'd want down here? Boring professor. All right, well, we'll go back to Wikipedia, and I'll just write down definitions, and you'll write them down, and that's, that's American learning. Bicycle wreck. I'm sorry? Bicycle wreck. I love it. So I would put that next to, I, I would bundle that into public transit, but I, I love that. So alternatives to the car. And so bicycle racks, uh, absolutely. And so thinking through, when would a for-profit developer bundle these characteristics into his or her project? Thank you. And that should be there. You're right. From the developer's perspective, and I mentioned this a couple of minutes ago, I want us thinking about, for a for-profit developer, building new commercial real estate. Welcome. When will he or she bundle these characteristics into a new property, or when will there be a green retrofit, taking some older building and incorporating these features? Folks, I'm going to be talking about the role of market forces, energy prices, water prices, customer demand, and I'm also going to be talking about government regulation and incentives. If government wants there to be more green buildings, how big an incentive does government have to introduce to get for-profit businesses to make these types of investments? And that's what I'd like to talk about tonight. And I don't know what this means. So folks, I first want to say some smart points, uh, which you might not talk about in typical real estate. Something that interests me very much is, I'm hearing a buzz out there. Someone's trying to distract the professor. This is, um, folks, with any, with any product, there is often risk and there's uncertainty. And so I want to start on a sad note, exploding solar panels. And I, I want to see what you think about this. So folks are ready. So a question. If a building installs solar panels, how long is a solar panel supposed to live for? How many years? 20 years. It's a good long life. So folks, one random variable if you're thinking about installing solar panels is will you get 20 years of energy generated? Because to go through the simple economics we're going to talk about later, you pay for the solar panels up front, you install these solar panels, and then you get your money back as they generate electricity for the next 20 years. So, but one random variable is whether solar panels actually live that long. And folks, let me jump to a point. The New York Times just ran the following piece. This was published in May 29th, 2013. Folks, let's read this. So this was an article that said the solar industry in the United States is anxious over defective Chinese produced panels. The solar panels covering a vast warehouse in Los Angeles were only two years into their expected 25-year lifespan when they began to fail. Folks, this is not China bashing. Everybody take a, take a deep breath and read this. If you're a business person and on May 29, 2013, you read this article, how do you now feel about solar panels? So if you're in a commercial building and you were thinking about installing solar panels, what just goes through your mind as a potential green investor when you read this article? Is solar still sexy? What risk and uncertainty? I'm going to need the Singapore cops to corridor off the area. What risk and uncertainty goes through your mind before you make the irreversible investment in these solar panels? 
Has the cost of solar panels changed? No, you still have to pay whatever it costs to buy them and install them. Have the, has the net present discounted value of the benefits of solar panels changed? Folks, walk me through an investor's thinking. I know I have several future billionaires in this room. What are you thinking? Is this new news? So again, there was the expectation that solar panels would live for 20 years. If you read the New York Times this day, would you, what, do you, what would you be thinking as real estate investors? Or would you just turn to the sports pages and see how many points Kobe Bryant scored? I used to be able to dunk a basketball. Not anymore. So he just raised an excellent point that there's diversity among solar panel providers. But folks, a question. He said a second smart point, and you guys are a terrific group. He said you have to buy the right ones. Santa Claus knows who's naughty and nice. Who knows who makes good solar panels versus bad solar panels? How? So if we are worried that there are many low-quality, defective solar panels, and they're not all from China, they may be produced from multiple different nations. If we're worried that there's low-quality solar panels, who, how, who is going to do the accreditation to certify who makes a high-quality solar panel? What new market would be needed to identify the high-quality panel makers? So a consultant, and there's always, I was rejected by McKinsey for a job. There's always, a, the consultants are very smart, there, right? but you were supposed to laugh. <laughs> Folks, but why should we trust the consultants? I, who do you trust in capitalism besides for your beloved professors? Don't trust me. Yes. So t tell me a story. He said other buyers. So I, I'm recording these comments for posterity uh, into my mic. So, so, so eBay and Amazon have these quality ratings. So what, t put that into a full sentence. All right. Um, well, I guess a good way to check for the quality of solar panels would be check their track record. I mean, the supplier's track record, whether they actually provide quality solar panels or not. So that was an excellent answer. He said if you develop a track record for excellence, the reputation might provide a reason for potential investors to not feel it's risky. The only problem with his answer is what if some NUS graduates build some terrific solar panels, but this is their first day on the job? Is anyone going to trust you? And, and, and so, the, so if, if you, we want to, it's interesting, how would you avoid that catch 22? If new guys don't have a reputation yet, then nobody will take a chance on you, but then incumbents don't face any competition, and the incumbents have a monopoly. So, so I agree with his point, but I want you thinking strategically. So if, in, if potential solar installers are worried about defective solar panels and, and that this could slow down the adoption of solar panels, what else can be done? What other, what other institutions? Yes. And so the government, if it is trusted and if it has experts working for it, government can play a productive role certifying products that they're of high quality. And it may be the case that some guys, folks, what would be an advantage of low quality panels? They'd be cheaper. There might be some guys who say, yeah, give me the junk. Uh, uh, but would want to be, so used cars are less expensive than new cars. When I was a graduate student, I had a used car. Uh, when I finally got a job, I got a new car. But, but they, we would have the proper government could play a role certifying the different levels of quality and then market forces would price that accordingly. Folks, other solutions for how we would figure out, uh, because again, the goal here is for the green economy to succeed, we need more developers to install these features. But if they're worried about this risk and uncertain about the quality of this new product, they might be less willing to pull the trigger other ideas of how to build confidence about a new product? Yes. Yeah, there, there are some uh, solar companies which they have uh, surrounded by uh, providing the solar panel um, uh, where the uh, owner of the panel is the solar company itself and then they produce it and there is a purchase, uh, power purchase agreement with the building owner to buy everything from the, uh, everything that the solar panel can be. So he doesn't take the risk on the equipment, but 
So he made the point of structuring the contract in a different way so that the buyer of the panels doesn't face all the risk. There might be a potential contract where the solar panel installer bears some of the risk and thus has the right incentives to install high quality panels. Very nice. So he made the point that the insurance industry might have a comparative advantage in screening companies because they'd be on the hook. If the panels turned out to be defective, they'd have to pay out. So you guys are being very smart at this late hour. You've earned your noodles. Let's break. The, um, a, a, you're being, so w w what I love about what you're saying, I'm a free market environmentalist. There is the worry in the New York, my mommy called me up when this came out saying, will this destroy the green market? I said, Mom, I just woke up. Leave me alone. <laughs> and, and, but, but you guys, while well, my mother's intuition was that the solar panel market would unravel as Americans would freak out and say, we don't want any more Chinese stuff. And uh, Americans love made in China. I, I think that everything I'm wearing, I, I'd be nude without China. And you would not want that. But you guys have come up with several ways to build confidence in the market and to restore confidence so that investors uh, who are risk averse can invest with confidence. Folks, let me go through two through five. Other risks in the green economy, other uncertainty is the future price of electricity and water. Folks, let me explain this in a nutshell. Suppose, let's go to the corner. Suppose the price of electricity and water were zero. Electricity is free, water is free. Is any business gonna build an energy efficient, water efficient, building. And so a tenant of modern economics, and this is not shocking, the bad curve slope down, is if there's the expectation that energy prices are rising and that water prices are rising, businessmen are going to be much more likely to invest in the green building. So a crucial, because buildings live for 60 years, a smart business person needs to think about where the operating costs for the building are going. And if these are expected to rise, even uh, a Republican, a Dick Cheney, a, vice, a, vice, a George Bush would want a green building. Next point that we're going to be talking about tonight is the resale value of the building. If you, if you own a commercial building and you want the option of selling it in the future, will your building command a price premium? What is your expectation of that? If you think the answer is yes, you're more likely to build that building. Folks, in terms of renting, if you're a commercial landlord, will your rental tenants pay more for green real estate? So let me come to a stop here because you guys get an A plus for class participation. When would tenants be willing to pay extra rent to be in a green building? So lifestyle, so put that in a sentence. You guys love the one word answer, that's correct. But turn that into a four word answer. T tell me about a tenant Tell me about a tenant who would be willing to pay an extra 20% to be in a green building, where the green are these criteria. Yes, they would have lower operating costs, and so you're being very good about calculating a present discounted value. But tell me about a specific business. Uh, uh, who, would be, who would be a tenant who would find this very attractive to be in a green building? <laughs> All right, and that's um, so. So let me crack a half joke, but you, you guys are still getting everything right. So you don't need me. Suppose that there is a company of creative people who come up with better ideas when they have natural light and when they can bike to work, that they're happy people, they eat their Google free lunch and they do creative things all day because they're in a wonderful environment. If the boss of that firm anticipates that being in green real estate has such an effect, in that case, there would be greater demand to be in such property, and demand creates supply. And so that's where we're going. And you guys are on to me. We've done this. Folks, it's now time to suffer. Who's ready for some algebra? That sounded sincere. Can I hear yay algebra? So, so we're going to do perhaps our only net present discounted value calculation to show everyone that I can dish out some pain. But it's um, but I, let's double check my work. So the year is 2013, and you are you're a business person who owns a commercial building, and you are asked to pay F dollars, where F could be 
a, a million dollars. This is some upfront expenditure to install solar panels. To keep the algebra simple, the solar panels only live for three years, and then they vanish in some environmentally friendly way. Uh, the solar panels generate S units of power each year. So S is some positive number, like 9 or 12. A, the benefit of having solar panels is that you don't have to buy electricity from the grid at a price of P. And of course, in any present discounted value calculation, we need to know the opportunity cost. The interest rate of what the bank will pay you if you deposit a dollar in the bank is R percent. And folks, here comes the pain. And of course, our final exam will be open notes. That was a joke. The risk neutral investor will invest in solar panels. So this is going to be a net present discounted value calculation. If the present discounted value of the electricity bill that she doesn't pay is greater than the upfront cost. So let's look at this. In the first year of the solar panels, it generates S units of power. And you can, you can sell that back to the grid for P, for P each. Then the next year, it generates P times S, but we need to discount that by 1 plus the interest rate. And then in the final year of the solar panels, it generates the, P times S is the dollar value of the power that the solar panels generate. And we discount this by 1 plus R squared. If the, if the present discounted value of the energy savings is greater than the upfront cost, you purchase these solar panels. But folks, if, if you're a risk neutral investor, but folks, I'm making many assumptions here, and I'm more excited about the next slide. So let's take a look at this. Many economists spend their life calculating comparative statics. Can you imagine such a boring life? So a comparative statics, a guy who devotes his life to comparative statics, and that includes myself and my wife, and hopefully not my son. Uh, he, he finds economics really boring. In real estate economics, we write down a model of an investor's rational decision. And then we ask, let's do four experiments here. Remember that the solar panels only lasted for three years. If the solar panels were expected to live for more years, why would that raise the probability that you'd purchase the panels? Because we would add another term to this, and the, the, the revenue from the panels would be more likely to be greater than the cost. So the first experiment here is the longer the panels live, the more likely you are to buy them. Folks, if the interest rate is lower in this economy, you're more likely to buy the panels. The reason for that is you're giving up this money up front, and the opportunity cost is you could have put that money in the bank. So the lower is the interest rate, the more likely this sum is to be greater than this. If the price of electricity is likely to rise, you're more likely to buy the solar panels, because that means that this P and this P are likely to be larger, making this sum larger, making it more likely that this sum minus F is greater than zero. And finally, if the panels are more productive in how much electricity they generate, if S is larger, then this inequality is more likely to hold. And so this is the, the algebra of investment, how we use net present discounted value calculations to calculate what is a good green investment from an investor's point of view. Next point. Folks, notice that there was no government. I had not mentioned the word government in anything we just did. But suppose that a government noticed that too few commercial building owners were installing solar panels. What a government could do is offer a solar subsidy, perhaps 50%, and say, if you install solar panels, we, the government, will use taxpayer money to pay the upfront price. What that effectively does is reduce the price of solar panels from F to 1 minus the subsidy times F. And so that would be one way that government could step in to encourage solar panel adoption. Next question. Folks, suppose that a business person did not have F dollars to invest in the solar panels. Suppose that they are capital constrained. Will a bank be willing to lend these guys the F dollars? So there, I would hope in your real estate finance classes, you've talked about capital markets and access to capital. So, so give the old professor one more chance. Suppose that the, pre, that the expected present discounted value of the energy savings minus the upfront costs is greater than zero. So it's a good investment to invest in solar panels. But suppose you don't have F dollars. If, if, if Matt Kahn is this building owner, if, if your bankers are you going to be willing to loan me the F dollars? How are you going to look at me 
at this low. So I knock on your door. I say, hello, I'd like F dollars, please. Do you call the Singapore cops or do you shake my hand and we fill out paperwork? What happens? There is a question of what is the interest rate. So you guys are being smart business people. So would you lend to me at the, at the risk-free interest rate or would you be a loan shark and say at 200%? And talk to me, bankers. Nobody wants to make any money. This is the nonprofit sector. <laughs> uh, do I have any bankers in the room? Bankers make money making loans to men and women who do something productive with the money and not default. Bankers lose money when they lend to someone like me and I leave the country. I, I'm here to get away from my U.S. creditors. <laughs> that was a joke. Good. That was funny. Folks, you're bankers. The market, the, the, the risk-free rate is R. A, talk to me. Are you, a, am I an attractive? I know I'm not attractive, but is this project attractive? You know what? When you have $10 and then you need to spend, you know, So Arthur suggested, uh, uh, pointed to what's the default? Do you, do you start with a building and then bring in the solar panels or say that building owners have to have solar panels? So, so, so this is a question of how government proceeds. Folks, let's, do my, let's spend one more minute on my banking example. As a banker, when would you be worried? What goes through your mind before you give me these F dollars? Yes. So he's asking, he's asking whether I'm going to default on this loan. So this comes back to this uncertainty that we were talking about a couple of minutes ago. And so if a banker is uncertain about, about these parameters, about the future price of energy, how quality are the solar panels, what's the future rate of interest, then she might be very unwilling to give me F dollars on good terms. And so I agree with you. So we've talked about it. But but let's slow down for a second since I think my next slide, yeah, that's a boring slide. Let's go back here for a second. As environmentalists, notice what just happened. If the commercial real estate sector installs solar panels, then we can sharply reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. But you are pointing out that for-profit bankers might have real reservations about lending this money. Folks, in that case, would you be comfortable using government funds to turn government into the sugar daddy? No, government could play this role, but money doesn't grow on trees. Somebody's taxes will have to go up to pay for this. But it, but it could be the case that government should play the role of lending this money. And, I, and so this is something I want you to think about. And I'd actually like to work on this in future work. So the research topic is this. We know we'd have greener real estate if more investors invested in solar panel technology. But many are liquidity constrained, capital constrained, and can't, don't have the upfront capital. If banks are unwilling to make this loan, then there is a role for government to step in. And I, yes? In Germany, they get So this is a very important point. Nations like Spain and Germany with their feed-in tariff and other policies have had very aggressive government policies encouraging the adoption of solar panels. And I think we're going to see more and more green real estate research around the world studying which government policies are most effective and cost effective at encouraging solar adoption. But I wanted to bring out some of the, the real estate economics here. Boring, 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 boring. Yes, this is interesting. We've identified one of the themes of my life's work. Maybe this isn't so impressive. I'll retract that. An idea that interests me very much is when we collectively face a challenge, one person's challenge is another person's opportunity. Uh, be, because uh, when we demand solutions, whether it's a cure for baldness or if it's a cure for fatness, that creates incentives for others to come up with a solution for those problems. 
there'd be nobody working on baldness medication if nobody was bald. So in the, if there is a situation where, uh, so in the case of financing green investment, I am a believer that bankers are going to, that there's going to be a synergy between bankers and engineers. People are going to invest their skills and human capital to figure out which solar projects are likely to be cost effective. A, I misspelled the word McKinsey here, but a, this, should, this should say McKinsey, the famous consulting company. The McKinsey Corporation did a famous consulting study that there's many investments around the world that are likely to have, to be many energy efficiency investments that are likely to be cost effective. And so, uh, something I want you to think about is, folks, let me ask you a question. Do you know that old bad joke about the $20 bill on the ground and the economist walking right past it? So there's a $20 bill on the ground, and an economist walks right past it. And this other philosopher walking with him says, why didn't you pick up the $20 bill? And the economist says, it's a counterfeit, because if it was real, someone else would have picked it up. <laughs> what does that joke mean? So I'm glad you found it funny. That means you get it. But that, that an economist believes that there's no $20 bills on the ground. What does that say about our logic? And what does it say about our vision of how capitalism works? That if there's ever an opportunity, someone has seized it. And, 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 and so if we have a market failure, that, that there's many good projects with pre positive present discounted values, but they're not getting done, some young banker will figure out how to evaluate these projects to get them financed, perhaps through partnering with government. But that, that uh, so we're going to see an emergent field during your lifetime. We're going to see an emergent field of green real estate finance where it's going to be bankers with capital and with expertise evaluating which green investment projects truly do have a positive present discounted value. And, and, and I, I am optimistic about that. So we've done this. I want to make a couple of points here. Another way to stimulate green commercial real estate is for energy prices to go up high. Folks, I want to make a point about government here. I am a fan. Uh, let's do it like this. Suppose that a government said to its people, we love you. To protect you against big, bad capitalism, we will never let gas prices go above $3 a gallon, and we'll never allow the price of electricity to go above $0.05 cents a kilowatt. So if government committed to price ceilings, how does that affect the demand for green real estate? if business people know that they face no positive probability of price spikes. We agree, I hope we agree that this would reduce the demand for green real estate because you face, you, green real estate is a hedge. It's an insurance policy against price spikes. And so an unintended consequence of government protecting its people against price volatility is actually to discourage green investment. Turning that around uh, has Singapore engaged in any in, in, in critical peak pricing? Uh, do those words mean anything to anyone? Critical peak pricing in California is, it, let me explain this in a little bit of detail because this should interest you. What many electric utilities in California are doing is they're recruiting commercial firms like a Walmart or a, or a building in downtown to sign up for critical peak pricing. And I wish I had a slide for this. No, I don't. Uh, I apologize. What critical peak pricing is, is the following. It's that for certain hours of the day when demand for electricity is very high, that the price of electricity will triple during those hours. Folks, when would a business allow itself to be faced with a tripling of electricity prices? They get paid for signing up for this. A, so, so, so I want everyone to think as a business person for a second. If you're a business, when would you be willing to opt in and sign up to have a tripling of your energy prices at the peak time of day? The answer is if you're a pretty nimble firm who can reduce its electricity consumption at that time. Folks, why are the electric utilities so eager to sign up commercial customers to face critical peak pricing? They are big users. What makes an electric utility crazy? Blackouts. What is a blackout? 
somebody make a statement about supply and demand? Is it, when, is it does a blackout for power occur when supply exceeds demand? A blackout occurs when demand exceeds supply. One way to reduce the probability of blackouts is, as he just said, to have some major commercial consumers participate in critical peak pricing, and you can count on the market incentive that these guys are going to sharply reduce their consumption at peak times, and this re increases the reliability of the grid, lowering the probability of blackouts. As a microeconomist, I'm very confident that we can use but folks, does everyone see the freedom here? California didn't force these firms to join critical peak pricing. This was an opt-in. They were free to choose to participate. But my point is this. If an electric utility introduces critical peak pricing, this creates incentives for the company to actually invest in being a green building that can adjust to these shocks. And so there's a synergy between the electric utility's pricing and the type of building that business people adopt going hand in hand. A any questions there? You guys are kind. Because I want to get us to a very good video in a second. So the professor's going to be less boring. This is boring. Uh, what I'd ask, I'd ask you to read my algebra on your own time. E the point of this algebra was if you own a car that achieves 50 miles per gallon, you can save a lot of money during times when gas prices jump up. But this will not be on your non-existent final exam. If you, if you own a very fuel inefficient car, you could face a very large operating expense for driving your car on when, if gas prices jump. Folks, uh, th there's been some optimistic work in the commercial real estate sector in the United States that commercial property that is Energy Star certified so Energy Star is the U.S. system for judging buildings' energy efficiency. And the great economist John Quigley, who's written some very good papers with Professor Dang here at NUS, John Quigley and Niels Koch did some very good work that commercial property that is Energy Star certified in the United States sells for a 7% price premium. As you guys mentioned, the Energy Star is a government Department of Energy program. It's a trusted certification, and government is the trusted source of information for partitioning buildings into those that are energy efficient and those that are not. And that the market in the United States rewards this. So, folks, a question. If you're a business person who's not an environmentalist, and if you sense that there is a price premium that you can sell your building for higher price, how does that affect your incentives to build a green building? I hope we agree that it increases it. The market is rewarding you. So this isn't about going to heaven because you've been green. This is the market rewarding you in this life for this. And that this premium will be larger the higher our energy prices because this will reflect the operating expenditures. So, did I see a hand? Yes. So that's a very nice point. So this should reflect... So. He's asking what's the marginal cost of building an Energy Star building relative to a conventional building. And folks, let's talk about that for one minute. So I like your point very much. What, so we, I, I need to make a distinction, but his point is excellent. Folks, this is the extra marginal revenue to a business person who invests in Energy Star. That's not the same thing as profit, because as he correctly pointed out, we need to know what's the extra marginal cost of building an energy efficient building. But folks, let me say something smart there since I don't have a slide for this, but I thank him for raising this. When the first Energy Star buildings are built, is the, is, is the extra marginal cost, by marginal cost I mean what extra costs are incurred to build an energy efficient building relative to a conventional building? Do we all agree that the marginal cost of building an energy efficient building will be high for the first buildings? We're still working out the technology. Folks, why are real estate economists optimistic that the marginal cost declines over time? What happens over time as Singapore, so think of Singapore, as Singapore starts to build hundreds of, com of energy efficient buildings, what changes over time? Besides from my getting older, fatter, and grayer. What else happens over time? There's economies of scale, but he is correct, but what do those words mean? What happens within the Singapore construction industry? Everything's outsourced to China. Everything's outsourced to China. 
We, but, but then if, if, if we go to Beijing, what's going on there? So I want someone to talk about learning by doing. When you have more experience doing something, you get better at it, whether it's playing a video game, kissing, uh, 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 it's getting late. The, with experience, uh, you get better. And to an economist, getting better at something is it becomes cheaper to do it. Folks, the second point, look at the young people in this room. If you choose to go into the green building industry, you, you will earn a rate of return, but the competition, as you enter that field, there won't be monopoly. It'll actually get, the, the price will fall as young experts enter the field. And so, so uh, as, a, as, a, as a baby industry, the green real estate industry starts to become an adult, you get a maturity and you get the economies of scale and prices per unit of quality decline as you get this thicker, more mature industry. And so that's what he meant by economies of scale. So that's an A-plus answer, but we need to unpack it a little. Uh, I'll, I'll give an example. You also get Adam Smith's, do you all remember Adam Smith's pin factory and specialization? That the, that the pin factory was productive because of specialization. So if installing solar panels becomes a very large, if solar panels become very in demand in Singapore, you'll get very specialized firms who work on one niche of the industry. They'll be experts at that, and they will quote relatively low prices to commercial real estate investors. And so the net effect of that is that this F and this goofball equation will decline over time because of competition and human capital investments and financing. Oh, now comes the fun part. Who's ready for fun? Yay. Let's hear it one more time. Yay. So first, let's not have fun. But then we're going to have fun. Life is about delayed pleasure. Uh, if you haven't noticed, hey, um, I'm still waiting. An open question is, commercial businesses will attract more tenants and be able to charge higher rentals if workers are happier and more productive in commercial buildings. There's a lot of hype that workers in green buildings are happier and healthier. I think we need to have more studies of this. I hope this is true. Uh, so th the issue of, of better air quality, as you were saying, b better indoor air quality, better light. If it is true that green buildings offer this, then tenants in green buildings will be happy and productive, and the firms that locate in these green buildings, oh, I, I pop up, you guys are reading my slides. Uh, if a job is, an, is a wonderful job, you can actually pay workers less and not lose them. And so this, so this is an important bullet point. I hope everyone in this room gets a pay raise. But if you are delighted with your job and being treated well, you don't have to be paid combat pay. And if being in a green building makes workers happy and content, a business will, will want to locate in such a green building to keep its workers and perhaps pay them less. I'm going to talk later in my lectures about field experiments. Let's pass on this now. By this, I mean how would we test these optimistic hypotheses? But we will come back to this, and it's time for fun. Folks, how many of you have heard of the bullet building in Seattle? So, uh, Tianfu, I'm going to need your help as my high-tech assistant. You, you take your place. And everyone, uh, let, so this is Seattle's, this is apparently the greenest building in the world. It doesn't, do you like its hat? That's a solar panel roof. And now what we, I give you in the notes a bunch of bullet points, but now let's watch the video and let's see what happens. So I'm going to press this button and you're going to press, <coughs> is anything happening? Yes, right there. What the Bullet Foundation is doing is devoting essentially all of its resources now to human ecology, the places where the conservation issues come in direct contact with, with humanity, and that ordinarily expresses itself in human well-being broadly written, but in human health in particular. Imagine a living building behaving like a living organism, harnessing enough energy from the sun to meet all its needs, using no water except the rain that falls on its roof containing no toxic materials, producing zero waste. Imagine you can design, build, live, and work 
in such a building. It's proof and it's proof of the scale, I think, that's surprising people. And it's true for the at a, at a size and in a location where people can interact and be aware of it and be part of the process. It's really incredible. We've gotten to the point where incrementalism no longer is doing the trick. We've, we've got to make giant strides, giant leaps in, into a new way of doing things. This was clearly not business as usual. They were really trying to reach a much higher bar than anybody else has. Seattle's Bullet Center is a response to the Living Building Challenge, the world's toughest set of environmental goals for green buildings. It's striving to create a model for true sustainability. Designed to last for 250 years, it sets a new standard for resilience and self-sufficiency. The process is part of the product. We're being closely watched out here, and I think that's a good thing, and hopefully it will for some more construction growth, especially in the green building direction. At the Bullet Center, the proof is in the process. Steel, concrete, wood, ducts, pipes, and panels reimagined and re-engineered greener by a host of architects, engineers, subcontractors, and tradespeople. We were blessed to be in business for 120 years, but we didn't get there by just resting on our laurels. We're always looking for new, innovative things, and the Bullet Center has created a great opportunity for us to expand. For subcontractors like Goldfinch Brothers, the center has demanded new technologies, partnerships, and learning. The chief innovation here is back to the future, motorized office windows that automatically open and shut to control temperature and allow natural ventilation. If you really want to build a green building today in any city in the United States, you'll find yourself in violation of maybe two dozen regulations and laws. The Bullet Foundation worked with the city of Seattle to review its building codes and help create pathways and incentives for higher performing, greener, living buildings. Our codes weren't developed to build a living building and we didn't know what changes needed to be made in our codes which is why we did the demonstration ordinance and basically said greater flexibility but still meet um, community standards for design. I think that this is uh, a collection of lessons learned. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of research and, and a tremendous number of stumbling blocks along with that. The real goal of this project is not to hide those but to share that information with other project teams in the future so that we can just make more informed decisions as we move forward. It really is going to be a showcase for the Living Building Challenge, a net zero building, and to be a part of that is, is pretty special. In a truly living building, the proof is in the performance. Does it meet its goals of energy efficiency and environmental stewardship? And can its human occupants change their own behaviors as well? I think that most people are prepared to make small changes in their lifestyle if they can be shown that it's in their interest to do so. Every occupant is going to have to be really rigorous about everything that's plugging into every socket because each tenant will have an energy budget they have to live within. We're just trying to make it a building where doing the right thing, the healthy thing, the environmentally sound thing is also the convenient thing. The Bullet Center is ultimately a people project. Innovation, instruction, imagination, creating living proof. If this building is alone five years from now, then, then it's just been a complete waste. Our whole purpose is to be an instrument of change. And to use this building not just to influence developers and architects, but also the bankers who finance all of these things, the city governments that set up the codes that make living buildings illegal almost every place in the world, all of the people who are involved in making these kinds of decisions. All right, folks, you're getting me again. So. I heard, I want to let you guys into the discussion in a second, but I heard uh, two, two of our themes. One was that ideas are public goods, that th this is sort of a guinea pig effect of a demonstration project to, to show, they didn't talk about what is the marginal cost of building this building relative to a conventional building, but did you notice their optimism that if they succeed in building this building that the whole world can learn from this and that there will be imitation and people visiting this building, that this is a demonstration project. 
Now a question. If those men and women you saw in that video were to march in here, what questions would you have for them? Would you just pray to them? Do I have any tough people in the room who would ask any tough questions? Or would you just say, do you know Kobe Bryant? The Kardashians? I'm sorry? So that's an excellent question. Did they make money on the building? So one of the reasons they've launched this is because they're trying to find tenants. Uh, so, so, uh, so, so, Tim Fu, can you come down and let's click on the leasing? Uh, so this was partially a PR thing. Uh, so can you type in this, uh, go to, uh, to uh, oh, but I, so, I, I got to read it to you. Uh, nope. To uh, bulletcenter.org. Uh, buildingcenter.org. No, no, please go back. Building slash leasing. Please go all the way back. Building and then slash leasing. And let's answer this question. And let's get a price. Yes. So that was one of our themes on Monday of in green cities, you get green people who want green products. You don't see this in Houston. So leasing, one full floor and co-work opportunity remains. Uh, do we get a price? Uh, so they're writing out some specs. There's one floor, there's a men's room and a women's room with showers. And, 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 and so it will interest me, what is the demand for this building? Which tenants will locate here? And, and will they lose money on this and boast to their friends that they're in this building? Or, or will for-profit firms locate here because it's profitable for them for the reasons we talked about, productive workers, happy workers? Folks, other questions you would have? Yes. How much more energy do you produce the material? So that's a life cycle analysis question of what resources were used. We saw some guy with some tool. It didn't look like they used their bare hands. Uh, it's, it's a reasonable question, and how they offset that. They other questions you'd have? Yes. I like, but uh, I find the statement that you are happy or keep doing something because first, there's no reason to have No, so I understand. So it's uh, so she's asking the question of uh, so that speaks. Uh, we've got the wrong thing on here. Come back over here. And so this speaks to this question of she she is skeptical of whether these uh, whether a green building really has these productivity effects. And I'm going to talk how you would design an experiment to test that hypothesis. But folks, the proof's in the pudding. If tenants don't believe that there are these effects, then they won't pay a commercial rent premium for the building, and the owners of that building will lose a fortune. So there's always a market test of who is willing to be in this building. Uh, but I wanted to introduce you to the greenest building in the world, they claim. And officials from Singapore and from other parts of Asia can fly to Seattle in Washington State and learn lessons from these guys and bring these lessons home and build a similar building at lower cost. Ideas are public goods. And, a, and this leapfrog technology is how the world gains. They're not saying. And so that's a state secret. And so it's um, the U.S. is clamping down. Eric Snowden knows. Uh, good. That was a test. The, the, um, the, the National Security Administration. The, folks, let me pick up a little bit of speed since I want to say some interesting stuff. Uh, this is worth a minute on, and I think I, uh, but I'm going to get you to your break in eight minutes. I'm keeping an eye on Tian Fu. He can't take this away from me. He, he's hungry for his noodles. Folks, one point, we talked about Adam Smith and the pin factory a couple of minutes ago. If the world started to produce globalization, global supply chains are going to play a leading role in the green real estate sector. Folks, how many of you have read my paper with Aparna? Do, do any of you subscribe to energy policy? 
So if you remember last night, you all admitted that you've read nothing I've written. I, I'm the most famous guy I know. It's, um, I, I endlessly fascinate myself. Uh, so a poem and I wrote this paper, and let me t uh, tell you a little about it, because I expect that none of you read it. Folks, here's what we did. We asked the following question. Over the last 20 years, we wanted to study India and China's role in green supply chains. Let me help you read this, and I apologize for all the numbers. I'm going to first do China, and then I'm going to do India. Folks, does everyone see China as the fourth row of the table? Yes, so, so he wants me to get to my point. But, but yes, but, but let the old professor speak slowly. The, folks, in the year 1989, what these numbers represent is these numbers represent the share of United States imports that came from the host country. In the year 1989, Great China sent nothing in solar panels to the U.S. Can everyone boo? Boo. In the year 2010, 44% of U.S. solar imports came from China. This is the, so this is the growth of China as a major player in the green economy. And this fascinates us. China's ability to engage in mass production uh, and the ability to produce ideally high quality but affordable stuff will raise the probability that Americans go green with their real estate. Uh, uh, let's do another one. So Denmark used to, uh, uh, Denmark used to export 95% in the year 1996. 95% of our wind turbines came from Denmark. This has fallen to 46%. India was at zero. Let's cheer India. India now sends 10%, 10 of U.S. wind turbines now come from India. Japan has had a jump, but in solar panels, notice that Japan is down. China's growth has come out of Japan's share. And so, interesting, I, so I don't want cheering and booing, I, I, this is not professional wrestling, but the point is, is that we can celebrate the role that de leading developing nations in Asia are playing in green supply chains, lowering the quality adjusted price of, of key inputs in the green economy. So this is how free trade helps to green capitalism. Too often, young people are taught that free trade's an enemy of the environment as factories leave highly regulated places and pollute in little countries. There's some truth to that, but the pollution haven hypothesis is, is not correct for reasons we can talk about. But a whole, there's a whole flip side that free trade, the global supply chains, are going to lower the price of wind turbines and solar panels, and this is going to lead to their wide adoption. This is how capitalism uncouples economic growth from carbon dioxide. And this is how we're going to get greater green real, uh, green real estate. Folks, the final thing before we go to break, and I want to do this in five minutes. I'm keeping an eye on Tian Fu. Let's take a look at Pang. Hey, handsome. So I'm working with a fine young economist at Cornell's hotel school. And uh, he looks good. I don't look like that. It, Pang is an expert on hotels. Hotels are a fascinating example of real estate. Has anyone ever stayed in a hotel? No. Have you ever noticed that electricity is used there? Have you ever thought about the green real estate at these hotels? And so I, for different pieces of the commercial real estate sector, we are interested in their energy efficiency. Folks, have you ever noticed that when you leave the lights on that you don't get a higher bill at your hotel? Have you ever noticed that if you turn on the water and just let it run for three hours, uh, you don't get a higher bill? That is called zero marginal cost. And when people face a zero marginal cost, what do they tend to do? Waste. So a very interesting question to us is how do you bring about sustainability in hotels? So one thing that is done, has anyone seen these nudges where you get the nudge in the bathroom that says, your, washing your towels uses X gallons of water. Please reuse your towels. How many of you have not thrown a towel down after looking at that? And instead took your stinky towel and hang it up to use the next day. And so your, the hotel is claiming they're environmentalists, but they're saving a fortune by guilting you out of a towel. And, and so it fascinates us how in an environment that does not use marginal cost pricing, how do you incentivize the hotel to be energy efficient. And we know that hotels, like other commercial uh, uh, buildings, use electricity for lighting, cooling, powering all the durables, the kitchen, everything that goes on in the hotel. So what we're doing with this project, and we can look at Pang's picture again, it, 
a major hotel chain is going to give us all of their hotel bills for every hotel in the United States for the last decade. So folks, I'll say that again, because does, when people say big data, do you get excited? So let me say big data, do I hear any chills in the room? Like I said, you know, Kobe Bryant's out there? Good, the, wait, he wants his notice. If, if I handed you every hotel, for a given hotel, for a major hotel chain, if I gave you, for, if I gave you each of their hotels monthly electricity bill for the last decade, what would you do with this stuff besides for just deleting it from your hard disk? As, as green, as, for those interested in green real estate, what would you do with those data? Do I have any young Freakonomics students? What, what would be, I'm going to call on the professors, so you guys better sober up. What, what, could, what could be done with such data? What are the nerds going to do? We're definitely going to run a regression. <laughs> but, 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 uh, but that was funny. The, uh, but, 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 but why? What's the payoff? We really are such losers. Uh, 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 why run the regression? And of course, the reason to run a regression is to study conditional averages. Uh, uh, let me answer my own question. The, um, yes. Uh, folks, here is the simplest geometry. I had fun that I actually correctly made a circle in PowerPoint. You're supposed to be impressed with the old guy. Folks, here is California, and here's the Pacific Ocean. We're over here. Nevada, I believe, is next to California. And here's, here is basically what we're going to do. I want you to work with the professor. Imagine if there was a hotel here. If, if I could hold my hand steady, if I hadn't been drinking, does everyone see that there's a hotel here on the California side of the boundary? Move two inches over, and here's another hotel on the Nevada side of the boundary. Folks, why would it be interesting to compare the electricity consumption of two hotels literally 100 yards apart, where one is on the California side of the political boundary and one is on the Nevada boundary? What's interesting about state boundaries? Would you predict that their electricity consumption are going to be the same? They have the same outdoor temperature, don't they? They're just 50 yards apart. So shouldn't the null hypothesis be that in July 2010, that it, holding occupancy constant at the two hotels, that they have the same electricity consumption? Why would they have different consumption? So that's what we're up to. So to make my point, so you guys can have your break and I can go have a drink. At state boundaries, as he just correctly said, electricity prices can differ and energy efficiency standards can differ. So now let me make my point because you guys have been terrific tonight. Using standard regression methods, we can say for hotels built in the year 1990 who have a 75% occupancy, so sta standardized for those features, you could say if Nevada, if Nevada has very cheap commercial electricity while California has expensive energy, we expect from the law of demand that we're going to see greater commercial electricity consumption at the hotel on the Nevada side of the boundary. So folks, we don't just have data for California and Nevada. We have every pair of states in the country. So I'm telling my co-author, we're going to focus on hotels close to political boundaries, and we're going to test for the role of state energy efficiency standards and the role of energy prices that often vary across states to study, do hotels in the same chain exhibit do those hotels in the states with high energy efficiency regulation like California consume much less electricity? And do those hotels in areas with high commercial electricity prices consume less electricity? And so we're trying to do a standardized comparison of how state policies affect commercial real estate energy consumption. And that's a project, if I'm ever invited back, I'll report on. Yes, sir. So, so that's an excellent question. He just said, Matt, the short answer is this. We think that what would go on, and do I have a slide? Oh, no, that's boring. What, he, what we think will go on is that the, manager, that the manager of the hotel in the expensive boundary side will be incentivized to fight waste, uh, turning off lights at night, uh, unscrewing light bulbs. There are things that the manager can control and that he or she would be incentivized to do so. So he asked the excellent question saying, Professor, it's still lurking the zero marginal cost, 
But despite that, we think that a manager would be incentivized on the expensive boundary side to take actions to economize. But that's a testable hypothesis. He could be right that there is no boundary effect at the boundary, and that's the job of a statistician. So if you said, Professor, why is this interesting? We're going to study whether electricity prices and regulations matter in encouraging green conservation within the laboratory of a hotel chain. And folks, I think we're ready for break. Uh, actually, I, I want to spend one minute. Boring, boring, boring. I want to spend one minute on Rajit God. And, and I'm sure this is the case at NUS. UCLA has an excellent set of engineers in our energy who are energy engineers. What Rajiv Ghat is doing at UCLA is he is trying to remove humans from the equation. He's creating these sensors so that if there's no activity in a room, all the lights go out. Uh, so so, so there, there's going to be a growth of, of smart technology, uh, of automated systems, such that even if people don't turn off the lights, and, and many universities already have this, that systems just shut down when there's no people in the area. And so there's a very interesting issue of how you remove humans from the equation without injuring their quality of life on a day-to-day -day basis. So you don't want an elevator you're in to stop functioning because you stood like this. Uh, uh, but, but if you're not there, you might want the system to shut down for a moment. And so it's this, this is sort of the rise of the smart buildings because of the smart engineers. And I'm sure NUS has a crew on this. Boring, boring. I think after break, I'll mention the rebound. But uh, Tian Fu of I, it is break. Let us break. Thank you, folks. We, uh, it, folks, have a half hour, so we regroup at, uh, it, 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 at 9, I can't do the math, at 9.10? Uh, 9.05, they've earned. <laughs> No, no. No, we have some interesting findings at the back of the paper. Okay. <laughs> 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 So, so you should type in uh, Jean, type in my name in Jean Cow C A O. We only have one thing to do. So, so I mentioned some of the so there you should read our real estate economics paper, where CG explains how we coded that up. So that paper came out of the real estate economics. And you could contact her about how we did that. Okay. <laughs> no, that in San Francisco that's been adopted how to make things work. And then we, because my boss was the previous commissioner of the so she persuaded friends to override all the housing code and build a pilot micro unit. And we had a border unit in the museum of New York City. That's interesting. And every material and because everything is like they have multiple functions. I'm trying to go. No, I can imagine that the first generation. That building, I'm trying to, yeah. It's going to come up and stop that. How much does it cost? No, I think there's a reason they're keeping that quiet.
Better don't go out. <laughs> I'm not going out. <laughs> I will stay with our event. And then, oh, enjoy. Dr. Mm. Khan, I cannot help uh, but feel that your the basis of your economics is based on the free market. Whereas, uh, I think the free market definitely needs the government's intervention in order to work. I have heard of uh, solar panel manufacturers who are actually uh, short-circuited by all producing companies who try to prevent them from successfully implementing their solar panels. And governments not supporting them because taxation on oil prices drew in higher revenues than sale of solar panels. So if the ecology of the country does not support green buildings, then it will fail. No matter how efficient, no matter how economically efficient, you, ha you can make the solar panels work. So in your example, I do agree with you. <coughs> so that is an interesting political economy example. Yes. So in Singapore, um, happens that one of my former classmates, Daniel Ho Teo Pin, uh, he is in the government and he's pushing for legislation to actually support green buildings with platinum, gold, silver, all these things coming in. But I think the crux of the matter is that if you ask building owners to uh, fit up their buildings, because of economic benefits, uh, it will take 20 to 30 years. Whereas, if you impose a tax on all buildings for not going green, then everybody will quickly want to... So I agree with you. So that, that really comes to this issue of opt-in versus opt-out. And, and, so, and so you... So uh, I, I hear you. And I think your incentive scheme would accelerate the green economy. Yeah, because if you leave it to the building owners on their side on, to do it on their own, uh, they say, no time, <laughs> or, or too expensive, or too troublesome. <laughs> but if you tell them, your property tax is going to go up by 10% every year. That would get their attention. Yes, definitely. So, so are we... Uh, they will impose that condition on you. BCA was just put it in as a condition. But we are talking about the majority of buildings. You see? Yeah. Yes. 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 To get a BCA approval, you have to put in all the green features, including the plants. No choice. No choice. But you see, yes, so 95 to 98 percent of our old buildings, if they are just left standing there without any green initiatives, the whole country is just not going to uh, feel the impact of Well, then, then they'll be subsidizing those building owners who are going to go green. Then, and that's fair, you see. There is a cost, as you say, there's no free lunch. But if you don't, you don't do the taxation part, uh, they will just take their own sweet time or they will never do it. No choice, uh, we work that way. Uh. See, so we are having two... We are, we are having two... I know what happens, you see. In the US and in Europe, they have the free market 
uh, where everybody is democratic, uh, we leave it to you, it's your choice. Uh, we provide the incentives, we tell you it's beneficial. Here in Singapore, we do it the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm learning, and, and I agree with you. I mean, but I it works, you see. So, given the set of conditions, say, on a state level, on a state level, they could do it. Nevada and California, maybe there are two different states. And one state has legislation, the other state says, free market. Do that would be a good experiment. Yes. Do it when you feel like And it. I think you're right. I think the result you said would emerge from, you're a good statistician, from, from, from the experiment you just set up. I agree with you. And that's... Um, just, a, just a bit of common sense, actually. No, I agree. <laughs> It's uh, common sense will take you very far. Yes. How has your horse been going? So th does it always meet at night? You're a brave man. I have to give free pizza at UCLA to keep my NBAs awake for this my seven as much as I dance around to keep them awake for the seven <coughs> to ten o'clock class. Okay. Tian Fu told me that many of them are working. You know, we get sleepier when we have to reach home and we still have chores. My dog has to be walked. <laughs> 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 do you get extra credit for that? Or, um, so, do, does Chairman Dang, uh, do, did you volunteer for this or you were drafted? <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about your work? Remind me what you think of what you're working on. Give me an example. Oh, so that's so I had a very so I had a very nice lunch with Anthony. Anthony. <laughs> and he, um, so Young Hank told me that I should be talking to you about reports. And so, you know, can, can you tell me something specific that you, you've done on logistics and reports, sir? Were you involved in the Tuas Sport proposal? Yes, 2030. Of course, it was just announced only by Li Tianlong. ship everything over the trust one. Yes, yes. <laughs> Suppose it's also employment creation. <laughs> Miss for the civil servants. <laughs> you keep jobs that way. <laughs> yeah, lah, yeah. Maybe that's a bit inefficient. Do they fight? Next <laughs> week <laughs> 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 money again. <clears throat> but I think it's the right move. The T5, T4 and the first spot. Right move. Mm. Only at home. <laughs> <laughs> I've been treated very well. Uh, so I mean, and I do... 
I do like to teach when students are good, and uh, since your students are very good, uh, Actually, I would like to have an appointment to see you regarding one of the projects. You have time or not? When, are we, when will you be free? You talk on the semester. Yeah, but I... Ah, okay. okay. And next week is the electronic week. That's really interesting. Is it, is it really for national security? Or is it, is it just being sophisticated about technology? But we need to keep our jobs. So at the University of California, they're, they're starting to have these enormous electronic classes, and they're so worried about uh, you know, will professors be needed uh, uh, of, of if, if there's some superstar video, you know, what's everyone else supposed to do? So, so I have a friend at NUS who's teaching environmental economics. So he didn't bother to record his own videos. He's just taking my videos and making that his lectures next week. I actually think it's pretty smart. But I mean, he listens to my videos first. So these things are good enough. So is that the one partnering with MIT? That's right. So I'd like to remind that, that, that we are chalk and talk. Got to catch up now. The correct answer must be some balance between the two. Yes, I hate it when I, you have to do web class. <laughs> because you only hear the guy, but you don't know which slide he's on. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a very interesting question because at the University of California, the, 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 the middle class demand that it be affordable, and there's a question of whether web learning can make United States universities cheaper. No. So we went in that place, or in... Oh, it's beautiful there. So, so I always wondered if you went to a new... So, so I you not sitting near the aquarium at Montreal? Because there were, all these, there were all these young military guys marching around, very close to the aquarium. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you must have loved it. It's beautiful. Though. I went to the LSE for a year, and so I would sit and sit, but I mean, <laughs> Were you in geography and then in Cambridge or operations research? So, so there are many famous economists. I mean, so I know Frank Conner is there for a moment. Yes. Yes. So, so, so David Newbery, or, or, or this person's name, it's a great university. Thank you.
Any announcements to the group? Or? Oh, thank you very much. So I think it's only fair to you guys to, to let you uh, get out a little early, so I'm going to hit the gas pedal, but I have one last slide from uh, talk number three that I hope will interest you uh, before we do some truly uh, uh, exciting stuff. So, so Walmart is a major company in the United States who I have been doing some work for, and I want to talk about uh, green real estate and make one more point that I think is worth thinking about. Uh, and let me just leave this screen like this. So Walmart is a chain store that runs hundreds. The Walmart headquarters has hundreds of stores. So for example, in California alone, Walmart has 220 super stores. 
have any, how many of you have ever been to a Walmart? It's sort of a one-stop shopping, selling everything under the sun, much of it made in China. And uh, the question I want you to think about is the following. Imagine a city, uh-oh, no noodles, no electricity. <laughs> imagine, imagine a city that had, yes, here's how I want to do it. Folks, imagine if there was 100 independent commercial buildings in a city. So uh, bear with an old professor. Suppose that a city had 100 commercial buildings and that 100 different people ran those 100 buildings. Does everyone follow the setup? In contrast, com contrast that with, uh, uh, if, with the following. Suppose that all 100 of those buildings were owned by Mr. Big. Does everyone understand those two? So it's the same city, 100 buildings. But in scenario number one, there's 100 small real estate owners. In scenario number two, there's Mr. Big who owns everything. Now, we all agree that Mr. Big is going to be very rich. But here's what I want us to talk about. Which is going to be the more energy efficient city? So there's 100 commercial real estate buildings. In ownership structure number one, there's 100 little men, each of whom owns one of the 100 buildings. In scenario number two, Mr. Big owns everything. Folks, which is the city which has the smaller carbon footprint if the city is just the 100 buildings? As I say to my son, you have three seconds. Three, two, one. What's your answer? And this is why my son doesn't speak to me. Are you fans of big capitalism? What is it about big, bad capitalism? Oh, I should have said big capitalism. Why does Mr. Big have a much more energy efficient city than the hundred little guys? You've got to put in a sentence. A scale is where a fat guy weighs himself. What is scale? <laughs> In English, well, what did folks say? Cost savings of what? Yeah, we, we save money by not giving you noodles. We, uh, <laughs> we know what we're doing. We, uh, so what goes on at the, at the, with, the, with, with the concentrated capitalist? What does he do? Why do I have the words, the human capital hypothesis is the first bullet point? If you own a hundred buildings, what would you do to make it? You tell me. So you you could do that, folks. What do management consultants do? Does anyone a, a what what can a McKinsey do for a corp? Why, why does McKinsey get hired by corporations? So I agree. Now, would the, would the 100 individual buildings hire McKinsey to do a workout to take a look at the organization? No. So, so let's do this again. McKinsey charges, so we now have the correct answer, but let's do it again. McKinsey charges per hour. They might charge uh, $50,000 to show up for an hour. Why is the firm with the 100 buildings likely to bring in McKinsey? The lessons that are learned can be applied to all 100 buildings. If, but if you're an individual building owner, you'll bring in your brother. Say, hey, bring a wrench and let's turn some screws. If you own a, so the answer was scale, but it had to be turned into a sentence. If you own 100 buildings, you're going to hire the best and the brightest, the most talented engineer at NUS and at MIT. Bring these men and women in and have them teach you how to do it right at one of the buildings. And then with that blueprint, you can do it at all your other 99 buildings. And so a very interesting issue is that a, is I'm actually a fan of scale in capitalism. That w in, in an economy, I don't know how this keeps happening got to pay our bills. In, in, an economy, in an economy where the scale hypothesis is, is because Walmart has so many stores, they have the right incentives to really learn how to make individual stores energy efficient, because then they can take those ideas and apply them again and again and again to all of their stores. While if you just had a bunch of small little guys, they don't have sufficient incentive to pay the fixed costs to make uh, their buildings energy efficient. They're only going to apply it once at their 
one store. Folks, there's a final idea I want to teach you in lecture three, and we're done. People are dangerous is the final idea I want to convey. Have you ever heard of the rebound effect? The rebound effect is the following. If everybody drove a Toyota Prius, when could that actually cause climate change? What is it about a Toyota Prius? It's very energy efficient. Folks, if you own an energy efficient car, then your price per mile of driving is very low. If your price per mile of driving is very low, what might you do? Drive more. There's a literature in economics that says that energy efficient products can actually increase your energy consumption. Can we giggle? <laughs> the, uh, there's a, so there's a literature, and I'll repeat this because you're all on to me, even though you have no food in your stomach. It's a tribute to you. I'm pointing to you. We're feeling guilty. The, that, that an unintended consequence of consuming energy efficient products is that people may actually increase their consumption so that it actually backfires. And I want to show you a real world example from a recent paper of mine. Uh, well, here's an example from commercial real estate. Suppose that, suppose that NUS, when was this building built? Can anyone guess the age of this building? 20 years ago. That's a good guess. Uh, so, folks, if, the, if, this, if this building has a bad HVAC system, then it's going to be very expensive for NUS to cool the building down. That it might cost, if it's 85 degrees outside, it might cost a lot of money to cool this building down to 75 degrees. Because of that, the, the building may not consume a lot of electricity and just keep it hot. If, the, if NUS builds a new building uh, for this school, then an unintended consequence of that is that you might run the air conditioning and cool the building to a lower degree, make it a more comfortable building. So there's a literature in real estate economics that when buildings install more energy efficient air conditioning systems, they may actually increase their energy consumption because the people who operate in the building set the thermostat lower. Is that all with me? That's a behavioral response that demand curves slope down. And folks, here is a picture from a recent paper of mine. So uh, with Niels and John Quigley, uh, there are three classes of real estate. Let me hear everyone. So in Singapore, are, is Singapore real estate classified into eight class A, B, and C real estate? Or is this just a U.S. thing? So in the U.S., we partition commercial real estate into A, B, and C. Folks, temperature, this is in Fahrenheit, not Celsius. Temperature goes from, that was a joke, goes from 50 degrees up to 100 degrees. And what I want you to notice, what we're graphing on the vertical axis, and let me stop pointing with my finger and use this instead. Folks, there is class A real estate, which is the high quality real estate. There's class C real estate. Folks, do you notice that it gets, as it gets hotter and hotter in California, do you notice that class A real estate increases its electricity consumption by more than class B and C? So this was our evidence in a recent paper, which I know you all read, on the rebound effect, that higher quality real estate, higher quality commercial real estate, as it gets hotter outside, increases its electricity. Those buildings that are of higher quality, as it gets hotter, consume more electricity than lower quality real estate. And our story for this is the rebound effect. They've got more energy efficient uh, air conditioning systems, and they're cranking up the consumption to lower the building's heat. There's more suffering in the B and C real estate. And folks, finally, I want to sell my $2 textbook. Have any of you ever bought a $2 textbook? So in America, environmental ex economics textbooks are 100 bucks each. Because I love my students so much, I'm selling a $2 book. So if you want to see all my jokes written down in one place, pay two bucks. With that, we move to our second act. The first hour, welcome, they look fed. Folks, I now want to turn to the residential sector. So we talked about the commercial sector's demand for green real estate. I want to make some points about the residential sector's demand for green real estate. And that's what we're going to do uh, for about 40 minutes. So here's a picture of a U.S. home. Do you see the American flag? Hey, hey. 
You see the green grass wasting water. You see the solar panels. What's interesting in the United States, there's two types of solar homes. You can buy solar homes where the solar panels are present and that you can signal to your neighbors. There's other roofs where the solar panels are hidden so your neighbors don't know that you have solar panels. There's interesting questions of who purchases solar panels to signal to other people something versus who wants this as a hidden characteristic of the home. There are also, uh, commu here's Germany. We talked about incentives in Germany for solar panels. When you take a train from Austria to Germany, you see a remarkable change in the number of solar panels as the train moves into Germany. The role that government policy plays in encouraging the green economy. It's remarkable at the Austria-Germany border, which of course have the same amount of sunshine, but which have different public policies. Here is multifamily housing. I think there's a solar panel somewhere here. All right. So a first question that I want folks to think about is I, I, I'm not going to be talking. I, I think here's what I want to say. I want to make a distinction. And I know that Singapore is a homeowner society. Folks, what percentage of Americans are homeowners? Sixty-five percent. So, uh, in the run-up of before 2006, it got as high as 69 percent. There was a celebration that many African Americans and Hispanics were becoming homeowners for the first time. There is a belief in the United States that a big part of the good life is being an owner. As we now know from the financial crisis, some households with with the probability of being unemployed, you might want those folks as renters. Uh, that there's a there's there's benefits of being a renter. You have more flexibility in your life. You haven't locked in. And if you lose your job, you don't have to default on a house. We, we've learned many things from the financial crisis. But 65% of the United States are homeowners. 35% are renters. I want us to begin to think about the incentives of owners versus renters uh, to invest in being a green real in living and owning a green real estate. This slide is boring. So a first point I want to make is I want to talk a little bit about multifamily housing. So of course, multifamily housing is where there's many people living in a building, like in an apartment building. And of course, as you all know, closer to the, closer to the city center, there's going to be fewer single family homes because land is expensive. And living in a skyscraper economizes in land as you substitute capital for land. Now, the interesting point is this one. In a multifamily building, you're going to have uh, you're going to have many people. It makes sense to have one owner of the building, uh, and and with many renters paying rent to that owner uh, to make a series of decisions for how you manage that building. I want to say something about split incentives. That's where I'm going. So. I want to tell a story of what I found in New York City. And let's see if this interests anyone. But maybe it won't. So let me be hypothetically a person named Matt and let him own a whole building. Uh, I used to live in this building when I was a young person. There is a guy named Frank who rents an apartment on the ninth floor for Matt. And he writes Matt a monthly rent check. Frank's monthly electricity bill is $200 a month and he pays his own rent. So again, I'm trying to set up the split incentives. That's what we're about to do here. Now, if Frank were to invest in new windows, new energy efficient windows, his electricity bill could be only $150 a month. Folks, the final thing I want to show you is it costs $900 to install these windows. So let's do this again, since this is going to be on our final exam. Frank. If, if Frank pays, if somebody pays $900 for, to install new windows in Frank's apartment, Frank would save $50 a month. Folks, when would it be a good investment to green this building by installing triple pane windows? If Frank expects to leave this apartment in six months, will he pay this? What you did in your head, let's assume the interest rate is zero, is you said, Professor, let me get this right. Uh, from a present discounted value calculation, 
if I save 50 bucks a month, but I only plan to live there six months, I would never recoup my $900. So only if you plan to live in the apartment at least 18 months. If Frank expects to live in the apartment more than 18 months, he would install these windows even though the, the capital gains would go to Matt. So that's point number one. The longer you, ex even as a renter, the longer you expect to stay in a unit, you might invest in energy efficiency, even if it's expensive, if you think you're going to recoup your upfront investment by saving on your monthly bill for long enough. Questions there? So this is an example of how one's duration as a renter, even if you're a renter, and thus you don't have a long-term capital gain claim to the property, if you expect to stay long enough, you can recoup your upfront cost. So we just solved for this. Frank faces a trade-off of spending $900 now to save $50 each month into the infinite future, but he doesn't have the right to sell the unit. We agreed that this investment has a negative present discounted value if Frank expects to stay in the unit less than 18 months. I think I want to skip this. What if it were the case that this window would save, hey, I don't think I want to do this one either in the name of time. Here's what I want to do instead. Now, here's what I want to do. Now, it's my building. What would happen if I paid the, 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 the electricity bill for the apartment? So again, what I'm trying to set up at this late hour are the split incentives. So in the first case, what we did was we first set up that a, we're setting up that a build, a, the apartment could be much more energy efficient if this upfront investment is made. And I want us thinking through whether anyone has an incentive to make this investment. Let's go to here. And here's the point I want to make. Suppose that the owner of the building pays every tenant's electricity bills. The interesting piece of economics here is the following. The owner of the building would have the right incentives to install the energy efficient windows, but if Matt pays the electricity bill, then the tenant, just like the hotel residents, faces a zero marginal cost and thus would have incentives to consume a lot of electricity. So a very interesting issue for both commercial and residential tenants is how do you set up incentives to incentivize the owner of the building to make the, the units energy efficient, but also to incentivize the tenants of the building to be efficient in their consumption. And so this is what I want us to talk about. And this is the split incentives problem. Now, a solution to this issue would be the following. We've already discussed third-party certification earlier today. We talked about third-party certification in the case of solar installation of certification certifying that solar panels are high quality and then investors would, could purchase those with confidence. Folks, suppose it was the case, let's do it like this, since some of you are talking in the back row and some of you are tired, let's skip this. Folks, when you buy a new car in America, you see this sticker. So when you buy a new car, it tells you the fuel economy of the car, it tells you the annual fuel cost, and this thing says you spend $1,600 more in fuel costs over five years. So in, on more and more cars in the United States, they are required by law to tell you the energy consumption and given current gasoline prices, how much money you're gonna spend and how much money you would save if you purchased this car relative to some other car. So does everyone understand this label? So folks, what role does this, when would such a label change a car purchaser's decision? Is information power? That the US government mandates that car manufacturers, that the EPA and the Department of Transportation mandates this information, what assumption are they making about car buyers? And, but, but, and do they know the fuel efficiency of different vehicles? So this is full information. 
so, uh, so, so this is requiring the sellers of cars to come out with the exact fuel economy of the product, and as he just said, the annual operating expenditure. Folks, a question. In Singapore, when you rent an apartment or buy an apartment, are you given this information? No. Why not? What's the difference between a car and a house? Let me come to a sub. What was your question? I was just curious what the benchmark was. So I actually don't know. It's, um, they would have to, so I know where this number comes from. I'm actually puzzled about where this number comes from. And so it does have to be benchmarked relative to something. Uh, I will report back tomorrow night on this. <laughs> Folks, why, so let me make two points since I'm starting to sober up again. Do we agree that this is a useful piece of information for car buyers who are sensitive to energy operating costs? Why don't we have the equivalent for residential and commercial real estate? So if you're a law firm looking to rent a commercial real estate space, if you're a family of four looking to rent an apartment, why aren't you given this same information of what your expected energy bill would be in that unit? Yes? So he just gave an A-plus answer, but he said it in four words. Uh, to repeat what he said, while it would be very useful to know what your family would consume if you lived in a three-bedroom in Kentvale, uh, it, it might be very difficult to predict that. Uh, so, so when you said vary, what varies across households? Uh, the size, the location, the facing. Uh, yeah. It's all new. It's all new. But the house is different. And so, uh, do I have any optimists in the room that, that such a report card could be built for, with, uh, with a statistical regression model, you could form a prediction for the average household who has a 47-year-old head, who makes this amount of money, who has three people. Yes, there would be a variance to that prediction, but you could form an, a, a best guess of what the household's electricity consumption would be in that unit. Folks, why doesn't that exist? Why aren't Singaporeans or Los Angeles residents provided with this before you move into a unit? Oh, but, but, but while that's true, you could predict for the average person. So in NUS's, I'm looking to the faculty, in NUS's real estate courses, these guys are taught prediction from linear regression models. Or, or do I need to do that? So folks, you have been seeing a linear regression model. You've been taught that you can predict for example, if you give people data on the age of a person and how much they weigh, you can calculate how their weight moves with age and predict what the average 47-year-old male should weigh. That would be a prediction. It wouldn't be a perfect predict. It wouldn't perfectly predict any one person's weight. There'd be a forecasting error, but those errors would average out to zero. So here's my point. I, w I want to hear it again from you guys. What cooperation would be needed in Singapore to, pr to predict for every household what its electricity consumption would be in every housing unit in Singapore. Who would have to cooperate with whom? I think that's part of the answer, but uh, you guys are making this too hard. What ingredients would you need to predict somebody's electricity consumption? Whose cooperation would be needed? The electric utility. Who is Singapore's electric utility? They have a data set on all of your consumption of electricity in every unit in this nation state. You would need them to hand over the data Folks, does your electric utility know your age and income and how many people sleep in your house? No. So you would also need some survey data. The credit card companies actually know that information. So you don't have to be Eric Snowden to do the following data merger. I'm trying to show, introduce you to my world. You would need to, to do this for Singapore and Los Angeles, because I've done this in California. You would need to take administrative data from the electric utilities 
on every household's monthly electricity bill. But the electric utilities don't know how many people live in your house. They don't know your income. They don't know your age. The credit card companies know this. The credit card companies would sell that data, and you'd merge the two data sets by street address. You would then know the electricity consumption and the demographics of the household who lives there. You would then use linear statistical methods to run a regression, and then you could predict anything to predict for a 47-year-old who lives in, a, in this three-bedroom unit at this part of town. Uh, you could predict the numbers in this matrix. But I'm, I'm trying to show you the, the big data challenges that you'd have to engage in to generate this type of data. There were a couple of hands. Yes. Oh, but, but, you, but you don't know it in units you haven't lived in. And, and so the goal of the statistician is to predict out of sample. So you know your own electricity bill, but you, what you would want to know is what would be your electricity bill in units you don't live in. Because folks, let me show you where I'm going, because folks are giving me puzzled looks. Suppose that there is a unit. I'm living at Kent Vale 2 right now. You can come visit me in a part of Unit G. Story 16, unit number one, come by. Say a big beer party with noodles. The, uh, <laughs> I forgot my point. Folks, suppose, suppose the following. Suppose that this goofball predictive model says that my apartment unit consumes 2,367 kilowatts, and let that be an enormous number. Am I going to be willing to pay high rent for this unit? I'll repeat myself. Suppose that it looks like a wonderful apartment, but suppose that the predictive model says that based, uh, that, that you, our, our best guess is if you live there, you're going to pay this as your monthly electricity bill. Folks, if you're given this piece of information, are you going to be willing to live in this unit? No. And so what will the owner of this unit do if, if the truth gets out that this is a highly energy inefficient unit? What will the owner of that unit who seeks to rent to me at a high rent do? I'm sorry? Oh, but it's now common knowledge. Everyone knows. Everyone knows that this is a very energy inefficient unit. It's, it, it, this is a very energy inefficient unit. What will the owner do? The owner will make investments in those windows and the other green investments, not because she's a big Al Gore environmentalist, but to lower the operating expenditure. So, folks, information is power. When consumers are educated about where the good restaurants are, they, they go to those restaurants. When they are educated that a building is very energy inefficient, they would boycott that building or demand a much lower rent. That incentivizes the owner of that building to invest in energy efficiency upgrades. So my point is this, because I know it's getting late in the night. When it is common knowledge, when the owner of a building knows that tenants know which apartment units are energy inefficient, those potential tenants will demand a rent discount to live in such a unit because the operating expenditure is high. That incentivizes the owner of that building to engage in retrofits to make it more energy efficient. And so this is this literature on energy certification. And so a major thing that this is this topic of energy labels. Uh, that if, if in Singapore and if in Los Angeles, if we can certify apartments as energy efficient or inefficient and verify the truth of these data, and this is easier said than done for the reasons you guys raised, if this can be done, this provides a very strong incentive for landlords to take costly steps to make real estate more energy efficient. Yes. I agree with you. And so, I, so I agree with you that car certification is easier than building certification. I agreed with every word he said. It, the point I'd like to bring out is in cities with a, in cities that have tenants. So, folks, notice that this 
Well, th this issue arises with single-family homes also. But a, a, we would have more energy-efficient commercial and residential real estate if the sellers of that real estate had to reveal. Let me do it one more time, since I don't love the way I did this. Suppose that there was a law in Singapore that before you rent or sell a real estate property, whether it's commercial or residential, you have to provide potential tenants with five years of past electricity bills. Folks, w what if that was the law? That might be sufficient to encourage energy efficiency. Maybe that's all I should have said, that information is power. Would anyone oppose that? So but, that you'd have to provide five years of bills now, there's a, if the, the apartment had been vacant, then that, that there'd be a zero for consumption, but that could be dealt with. Yes, there, there's two hands. We we'll start with you and go back. So what is the resistance So I don't know the answer to that question. I think that's an excellent. It, it might have been viewed as intrusive. So in America right now, there's all this talk about privacy, and and I. So when I type stuff into Google, I just assume that everything I do is in, in the public domain. That Eric Snowden is watching me from Russia. And in the United States, there's a lot of anger about people want confidentiality. They want what they type into Google to be just known by them. And and, and so I think it's an issue of privacy in the U.S. But I, it, it's been very slow. This revelation of information. I, I don't think there's a legal issue against it, but it's been very slow to happen. Uh, but yes, in back, please. Uh, two points. I, think the, I do agree with you. The first point probably is that the law requires developers to reveal how much they have paid in the past five years of So that was my last slide tonight. He has heard enough from me, and we could jump to the last slide. So folks, the smart meter, so to repeat what he said, and you guys have been excellent tonight without noodles. The Folks, I assume this is going on in Singapore. In California, there is great excitement about the smart meter, where this is not a cell phone. What the, the smart meters are being deployed across California, and as I understand these things, these are devices to make households and make commercial businesses smarter. So, for example, as I've run this computer tonight, how much electricity have I used, and how much has this cost NUS? I have no idea. It's, it's free money for me. Uh, a, a, this thing can calculate that. So in terms of the language of economics, what was the marginal increase in electricity consumption for NUS because I've had, the, oh, I've been running on battery, so I guess the answer is zero. <laughs> the, um, the, but to his point, if a household runs a hot pot or turns on the fan, you can use your smart meter to calculate how many kilowatts you used and what is the price at this point in time for that kilowatt. So the smart meter is going to make households and businesses smarter about how day-to-day -day actions, turning on the lights, using the PowerPoint, maps into expenditure. And if, if businesses say, holy crap, we're burning through a lot of money, they might turn to their real estate landlord and say, we need you to make these investments to help us reduce our operating expenditure. So, so, so he very eloquently, the rise of the smart meter is going to make urban consumers smarter about how their day-to-day -day actions map into electricity consumption, and this is going to incentivize them to seek out greener real estate. Because folks, before the advent of smart meters, how often did you learn about your electricity consumption? Once a month. Does anyone even look at their electricity bills? And so before the rise of the smart meter, you were getting a monthly bill. 
now every, you, now every 15 minutes you can stare at this thing. It's, it, you're going to lose your life just staring at this thing. <laughs> but but if, for those who want extra information, you're going to get real-time information about how your actions map in to energy consumption and expenditure. And so consumers in California are going to have no excuses about being naive uh, when they're armed with these things that are being rolled out. Folks, there are a few more questions. Yes. Yes. They didn't exist. So that's an excellent point. So he's two steps ahead of me. So, so what do we do? So there we need the government to certify Energy Star or Green Mark. So that is so for products that haven't existed. He's right; they have no track record, and so that would be a role for government to step in to certify this. He's, he's absolutely right, and, and so I agree. So let's see if I have anything else to show you. So we've done this, folks. I do want to make a point, and I want to ask you a question about Singapore, folks. This. In the United States, households pay for electricity by an increasing block tariff, which has the ugly acronym IBT, which is not your metro system. The, that was a joke. So let's say, so in, in Singapore, do commercial and residential pay, face an increasing block tariff for paying for electricity and water? So let me make sure everyone knows their increasing block tariff. Folks, this is Southern, Ca oh, this was my work with Frank Wallach of Stanford University. Folks, I, I know this is hard to read. If you consume zero electricity, you're here at zero. As you move in this direction, you're consuming more and more electricity. What I want everyone to see is, but does everyone see the rising staircase? Here's how to read this. If you consume less than 500 kilowatts of electricity, up to your first 500 kilowatts, you pay 12 cents a kilowatt. For, when you go past 500, you then jump to 14 cents. So does everyone see that the marginal price of electricity is an increasing function of your base consumption? The reason the United States does this is to protect poor people. It is assumed that poor people consume relative, relatively little electricity, and to charge them low incentive, uh, means that they're not being price gouged, but then if rich people consume a lot of electricity, you then, they pay 31 cents up on Tier 5. The area of each of these rectangles, if you consume 1,400 units, you add up your, your electricity bill is price times quantity. The area of this rectangle plus this rectangle plus this rectangle plus this rectangle plus this rectangle. Folks, if we want green real estate, if we want more energy efficiency, how does California bring this about? By raising these pricing tiers. Uh, if you had a, st if this staircase were steeper going up to heaven a a a a in a steeper way, that would be a way to incentivize greater green business, I mean, green real estate investments. Any questions on this structure? Frank Wallach and I ran a field experiment, which I'd like to briefly tell you about. Folks, do you think the typical person in Southern California understood that they faced this pricing structure? How smart do you think Americans are? <laughs> so Frank Wallach and I, in a paper that's going to make me even more famous, uh, look at this sexy title. Look at this. Look, whoa, 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 whoa. So this was his title. He titled it Using Information to Improve the Effectiveness of Nonlinear Pricing. What a title. We, what we did was we offered, we, this is almost funny, we offered Amazon gift certificates to households in California to take a 20-minute internet course with us. Have any of you, we paid people to spend 20 minutes with us online. And what we did in the 20 minutes was we explained to them the increasing block tariff. And because the electric utility had given us data on each of our household's electricity consumption, we taught them where their monthly consumption lied on this tariff. And let me tell you the key finding of the paper so you don't have to read it. Folks, for households who learned that they face a very low marginal price, what happened after we educated them? What did, how did they, what did they do with respect to their consumption? They increased 
they increased their consumption. <laughs> For guys who were up here on the fifth tier, and d but didn't know it, it, when we educated them, what did they do? They reduced their consumption. And so apparently the American, there, so people respond, people did not know the marginal price they face. And so the smart meter is going to, we argue that the smart meter is going to continuously teach people what marginal price they face. And when people are educated with this information, they make better choices. So again, as you guys anticipated, we documented that when you educate people about this complex pricing function, that, that they face a low marginal price, they increase their consumption. Guys who face a high marginal price but didn't know it, after you educate them, reduce their consumption. And so when people read our paper, they said, Matt, why did you educate any of these people? You should only educate the right tail. And, and we can come back to that, but that made my co-author very angry. I want to make just a couple more points and be, be done in five minutes, to be fair to you guys. A topic that interests me very much in the context of residential real estate is why do, why do homeowners install solar panels? There are at least three different reasons that economists, real estate economists continue to test. How much of installing solar panels is about saving money? How much is about saving the world and impressing friends? And this has been a harder hypothesis to test. I'll tell one funny story. There was a PhD thesis out of UC Berkeley where a guy named Steve Sexton did the following. Steve is a friend of mine, and he, got, he studied cloudy places in the US where the sun doesn't shine and studied solar panel installation there. Folks, if the sun doesn't shine, do the solar panels generate any power? No, then why are these guys installing these? And he documented that those were the liberal, the, the, in the Portland, Oregon, people are installing solar panels because it's, it's liberal, it's the righteous thing to do, but, but it makes no sense in, in, in terms of um, generating sunshine per dollar installed. And so he was an interest. So he was trying to separate out the motive of if it's a sunny place, a Republican might install these, versus in this cloudy places where liberal environmentalists live, many of these solar panels were installed. And so the motivations for investing in green real estate are interesting. I'm going to skip that, folks. In Singapore, our professor uh, Professor Young Heng Deng and co-authors have done exciting work on the role of the Green Mark program. And I can point folks to this paper of how Professor Dang tested and documented that the Green Mark program, that those buildings that have the Green Mark energy certification sell for a price premium. So both in the United States and in Asia, we see that, uh, that energy efficient buildings do sell for a price premium, but that's not a law of physics and much more work could be done. Let's see what I want to end on. I don't want to do this to you. I think that's cruel. We've done this. I want to do these last two slides and call it a night. In the case of residential green homes, I think a very interesting question is, how, right now it costs $30,000 in the United States to make a home a solar home. Over the next 10 years, will that price fall sharply with learning by doing and other progress? At $30,000, many homeowners don't want to do that. We alluded earlier when everyone celebrated my paper with Aparna and you, everyone told me they had read it. Uh, the role that China and India are playing in global supply chains, which lowers the price of renewable power. Folks, in our next lectures, we're going to be talking about a global carbon tax. Uh, we don't have a global carbon tax. If we did have a global carbon tax, that would, of course, nudge many new investments in green power. But what we've been talking about tonight is without a global carbon dioxide tax, the incentives and willingness of real estate owners to invest in green real estate. And so what I want folks thinking about is in the absence of carbon taxes, and we'll be talking about this next time, 
uh, how do you encourage more people to live an energy efficient lifestyle? And I think a very important role that the first generation of environmentalists play is by being uh, guinea pigs which allow the sellers to learn and to become more efficient producers. So first, let me stop there. And uh, any questions about residential real estate, and I will stick around to talk to folks who want to speak one-on-one. -on -one. Yes? Um, I'm just curious, so basically the whole discussion about residential real estate is actually kind of based on the assumption that energy efficiency is a priority for the market. Um, I'm just curious uh, if there have been any what chunk of the market actually do care about the environment? Actually, do care about the energy efficiency? Because they're the ones who actually pay the premium at the end of the day. And I'm sure there are some people who actually would be willing to pay the premium. The question is really how big the chunk, I mean, how big a chunk of the market are they? And if ever they're there, are they growing? Or is it, uh, is it basically worth, worth it for the developer to actually invest in these things? And put the price tag that actually has an extra cost? So this answer depends on two parameters. If the price of electricity is zero, then nobody w will want energy efficient. It, so it crucially hinges on what's the price of energy. Uh, the reason the Toyota Prius has such a large market share is when the price of gasoline goes up. No one would demand a Toyota Prius if the price of gasoline were zero. And, and so th there's a, there's, I view this as a two-parameter model. If there's more environmentalists in the population, then there will be more demand for green products even if the price of energy is low. But holding the number of environmentalists constant, as the price of energy goes up, there'll be more and more people seeking out uh, these products. And so recall our first, recall our first lecture tonight, but I, I, your question's an excellent one. And let's see if we still have it here. Yes, we do. So the key it really comes, recall where I started the night, of what is the energy savings? So the short answer to your question is, if you have solar panels, at what price of energy does, this, does the saved operating expenditure add up to a large number? So this is really a question of how income sensitive you are. So think of yourselves, folks. If a textbook is an extra $10 higher, do you choose not to buy it? At what price do you change your behavior? If your favorite restaurant doubles prices, do you still go there? If it triples prices, do you still go there? We all have a price. There's a price you could pay me right now to strip nude. We, 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 we all have a price. There's a price I could pay you to kill me right now. It's, um, and, and so we're always at the margin. And so, it, it, so for different people may have a different price. But for people who are living close to the margin, a fairly low savings can induce behavioral change, especially if you're an environmentalist. What we need uh, is to allow prices to reflect scarcity. Uh, and, and then I think we would see more people adopting this technology. So you asked just the right question. You asked the classic question of economics, how many people are at the margin? Uh, a, 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 how, a, how big an incentive do people need to make this choice? And my claim is that governments, for a variety of reasons, uh, that remains an open question. But, but I know a, from my real estate economics training that, 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 that you'd be more likely to make the choice based on the comparative statics we talked through here. And so that these factors are key in the going green decisions, and I'd send you back to there. A, a final question for the night? Yes. I want to ask whether is there a first mover in the advantage? Because you know you talk about like sales and production costs coming down so but that takes time. So who is going to be the first person that will take that step? So that is a terrific question. Tim Fu, can you get me back? Can you I need you. As usual I need you. The, the, uh, we need to do something fun to end the night. So if, you, uh, if you've got some time in your life, you go, I'm not in control. Maybe we don't have time in this life. So what I wanted to show everyone, but I will not take your lives, 
is I published something in the New York Times two years ago thanking China for being the first mover on solar. Under the World Trade Organization was saying that China was playing dirty in solar markets. Oh, so can we clear this? So if you type, this is going to break my back. So if you type in Matthew Kahn, room for debate, <laughs> China, New York Times. How we gain from China's advances. So I publish this. I, people are always sending me hate. Uh, it, it, the hate is strong. How we gain from China's advances. Last September, the Times published an article sketching out the details of how China plays dirty in green tech as it offers cheap land and cheap loans to its nascent renewable energy sector. But new ideas are public goods that spread across continents. And so China has, been, has made strategic investments to be a leader in this field. And my point was that the U.S. Uh, gains in, in this case, that China has made a strategic decision to make an enormous investment in these fields. But the World Trade Organization was accusing China of violating WTO rules by, by, playing, by, by, by having these strategic subsidies. So but to, to your question, there, I don't know the answer to your question. The, the first mover advantage occurs if you can develop a reputation. So Google was not the first mover in the web browsers. Yahoo, and there was somebody before Yahoo. It may have been that Netscape. And so there's examples out there where the first mover didn't win the competition. Where the, the, the benefit of not being a first mover is to wait and see and to try to learn from other people's failures. Uh, and, 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 and to wait and see. So I, you asked an excellent question, a strategic question, where I actually want to hold my tongue. I, I don't know the answer to that. Where there'd be a role for government. Let me say this, because I do know this. If many companies are not entering the green tech market because of their concern that there's a first mover disadvantage, then there's a role for governments to play as the first mover. And so I certainly believe that point. E, for a specific firm, whether there's a first mover advantage, I want to hold my tongue. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Yes? Can I relate a question to me about marketing? Yes. And I happen to be advising one client, a Japanese client, who has some marketing product, and he wanted to implement them in a very large scale. And he wanted to have some of the information. But you know, obviously, it's come at a higher cost. And so the biggest question was, like, would people be willing to pay like 20% more? for traditional home and to launch this into a very, very big township. And very quickly, the answer becomes no. Let's not try to do something so uh, ambitious. And uh, you know, let's do back something that <coughs> what the market wants today rather than what the market will want in the future, even though all the tests and studies will show that there's tremendous savings in having this sort of market. You may have handled that analysis right. So here's the way I would say it. I think I agreed with every word you said, but I'd like to add one nuance. So folks, the, 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 the key question in his consulting case is the following. For the Malaysian households, if they don't have the smart meter, are they wasting money on electricity? If the price of electricity is very low, then it's likely that their electricity bills... So are, is the price of electricity very low in Malaysia, or do they face this type of block tariff? I couldn't hear you. It's a single standard tariff. And, and are, are prices high or low relative to Singapore? Very low. So if prices are very low, then everything you said is correct. Where the smart meter really comes in handy is, is, is avoiding peak prices. You save your money. So to, to make this point, because your question is an excellent one, the smart meter is only a cost-effective investment if you are at risk of facing a very high fifth-tier price. Uh, but if the pricing is always constant, uniform in the domain, then I can see that I agree with every word you said. The smart meter has value when it allows you to avoid making a mistake. To a cost-minimizing consumer, a mistake would be if you spend too much time on the fifth tier. But if the fifth tier doesn't exist, then I agree with every word you said. If there's the expectation that Malaysia is going to introduce an aggressive increasing block tariff, then it might make sense to introduce the smart meters. The smart, 
Folks, the smart meter is like measuring your blood pressure. Suppose that your blood pressure varies over the course of the day, but that you don't know that unless you have a smart blood pressure machine. You could have very high blood pressure and not know it and be hurting yourself. Uh, in that case, you would benefit greatly from having a device that continuously monitors your blood pressure. But in a case where you always face the same price for electricity, I, 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 unfortunately, I don't see the need for the smart meter in that case, especially if it's very costly to install. One last question. We're actually ending on a high note, but a low note. But it comes back to one of my themes, that we need, we need uh, to encourage the green economy, there has to be an incentive uh, to, to economize. And if there's no incentive to economize, then we have to rely on environmentalism and other criteria to economize, because there's no fear of being price gouged. Yes? So I believe that will be our theme of tomorrow night. And so, so I think I think on that note we should end. So you 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 you, you come to me for a preview. Uh, so we will make this like Star Wars. But I've warned everyone else. So you come to me, young man, and I will whisper to you the answer. <laughs> Good night, folks. <laughs> I will be ready. I will call on you tomorrow. Uh, <laughs>